It's a chaotic time to be a creative. Hi everyone, I'm Lori Fagan, and welcome to AZ Creates, a web series about the many creative people right here in the Grand Canyon state of Arizona. So it's chaotic because we're wondering if galleries are going to start opening again. Do we keep entering online shows or will there actually be in-person shows soon? Or perhaps there's some chaos in your studio that could use a little attention. I know for me, studio chaos is pretty normal, but I will say I've done a lot more cleaning and sorting this past year. So to calm some of that chaos, join us as we talk to Sandy Ashbaugh of Chandler, who works with hand building clay as a ceramicist and retired police officer and author Timothy Moore will be along to talk about the origins of the Miranda rights. We'll highlight the Ocotillo Artist Group for Fine Artists. We'll bring you more arts events and something to look forward to. And we'll close with a quote about chaos from musical composer Stephen Sondheim. Be right back. AZ Creates is sponsored by The Times Media Group a digital and print media company that operates in the Phoenix and Tucson metro markets. It serves a wide variety of demographic audiences and communities with more than 1.1 million printed copies and millions of online readers each month. Publications include the Santan Sun News, Chandler, Arizona, Gilbert Sun News, Mesa Tribune, Scottsdale Progress, and many more. For details, visit Times Publications at timespublications.com. Welcome back. On today's Creative Connections segment, we'd like you to meet Sandy Ashbaugh of Chandler, who creates contemporary artisan ceramics. Thanks for being with us today, Sandy. Hi, Lori. Thanks for having me. Glad we could today. Now, you have a Bachelor of Fine Arts from Florida Atlantic University. You don't look old enough to have been doing ceramics for 30 years, as was in your bio. Um, your pieces are beautiful. And you make a lot of Japanese sake sets, and they all have this elegant color palette. So what draws you to the Japanese style, the Japanese designs? I think there's something with the very simple and elegant and refined lines that a lot of the Japanese architecture and clothing and um, a lot of their things use. Um, uh, for example, the kimono, very simple lines, but inside the simple lines, there's a lot of pattern going on oftentimes. And, and um, after I started creating these, I've noticed that there's a lot of correlation to that. So when people are throwing on a wheel too, it's spinning very fast and you have to work quickly and any little ding that you might put in there can just totally make the piece go literally haywire. So this is a little more methodic, perhaps a little slower, a little calmer, would you say? I would agree. Explain how your work is a little different when you're doing hand building or as you call it, slab construction. Uh, often it's a slower process. Um, I, it's easy to picture in your mind if I tell you that I roll with a rolling pin like you would uh, roll out cookie dough. And then I um, create my own templates. Um, this is one of them. Um, this is one of the shapes that I use for my uh, sake set bottles and flower vases. And... Um, I roll out the clay very thinly. And Ooh, it is thin. This. And then I will take the clay and mold and shape and sculpt the clay into the form that I'm looking for. So let's talk about scraffito. Tell us what that word means and where does it come from? Scraffito actually is an Italian word. To me, it means to scratch. Um, and I use uh, various tools, um, metal tools like this, and uh, sometimes pencil tips, different things like that, to actually carve into the clay to make designs, to make markings. Just a small disc of clay. 
and I've painted some uh, red underglaze on this piece. And this tool that I'm going to use is a very thin tool, and I can press in and carve and cut away some of the color. Let me show you another, another piece. And that is wet clay, right? This is wet clay. And the wet glaze. And you carve right through it. Interesting. Yes. That's beautiful. How cool. Screffito. What a name, huh? It's fine. So let's take a little closer look at one of your beautiful sake sets. The four-piece set is... Um, as you said, a sake set. Um, it is a two-serving bottle, which is in Japanese is called a takuri. And then I serve it with two small uh, cups, handheld cups that are called ochoko. And then it, I serve it on a uh, wooden plinth or, pl or pedestal that I make. And I use a technique to finish the wood called shosugiban, which is a form of singeing the wood. Um, there's historical a tie-in to the Japanese that way. But I think it, it brings out the grange in the wood and it gives a platform for the set. For sure. Now, you also make some hand-built vessels as well, or flower vases. Uh, here's one that's just gorgeous. Tell us a little bit more about it. These... Uh, flower vases are based on the um, Tukuri, the, the sake bottle design, but I don't use, uh, I, I don't put a spout on it. And I'm making them larger and more uh, a heavier base and more stable so that they can support um, flowers uh, versus just liquid. But they are also waterproof then for both, either whether it's sake or whether it's water, correct? Yes, and I do test them after every firing. After they get out of the glaze firing, I make sure I test them and uh, make sure they hold water. <laughs> now, you also create some stunning wall art, and uh, the piece we're going to show is part of your Meridian series. Describe it for us, please. This is a different technique. I put clay into a very large extruder. Um, if you've ever used a cookie press, it's an industrial sized cookie press um, and I push the clay through and it comes out in tubes in various shapes depending on the dye that I use. Once I have that on my table I start cutting away forming pieces uh, and then I hand finish and hand glaze those and then I attach them to um, a frame or a wood backer and uh, then make sure that I it's uh, wall mountable they are just gorgeous as well so that gives you quite a range of different items that you make as well now you are also the director of the okatio artist guild which is a group in the southern chandler area and you just had your second show tell us about the organization and what some of the future plans are for the okatio artist group well there i found that there really wasn't um, a group in my area. And there are a lot of art groups that are based on, you know, two-dimensional art. And I really wanted a group in my area of town that was, um, you know, people with all different types of medium coming together um, and supporting each other. So basically it's an artist group run and, you know, run for artists, for artists. And we are, um, you know, we're, we're there to support, encourage, network with each other, and uh, we are uh, fulfilling that by having, um, we just, like you said, just finished our second sale, um, and it's an, been an outdoor event, and we're trying to support artists as business people, try to, you know, offer opportunities for them to sell locally and help encourage them with the business part of their art, which is a different focus than a lot. Right, and it's so important for people, whether they're 
emerging or established artists to be able to, some people are fabulous artists, but not so great on the sales part of it. And that's uh, always a challenge for many. You've also teach classes, teach private lessons. Tell us a little bit about some of the techniques that you teach and uh, what you like to, uh, to do when you're in a, a one-on-one -on -one situation. I like to cater to uh, the person taking the lesson. I have a small studio, so I only um, allow one or two people in the studio with me at a time. And I find out what it is that they're looking to do. I, I customize the session or sessions uh, depending on what their wants and needs are. Do they want to uh, just make something fun and functional because they've never had a chance to do it before? Or um, I've taught children the the you know, parent will bring one or two of their children in and I work with them, teaching them how to um, form clay to, to make something, whatever it is that they want to do. Uh, most of the things that I teach are functional, so bowls and plates and cups and things that, and that they can use again and enjoy. Um, but I can um, uh, work with them to make more sophisticated items if they wish. And I will fire them in my kiln and uh, provide the glazes and provide uh, all the tools that they need to have a fun experience. Wonderful. That is great. So if anybody would like to contact Sandy uh, through her about her beautiful artwork or uh, for a private lesson, you can find her on her website at sandyashbaugh.com. And Sandy is also very active on Instagram and Facebook at Sandy Ashpaw Ceramics. And Okatio Artist Group has both a public and a private page, right, on Instagram and on Facebook at Okatio Artist Group. Thanks so much for being with us today and for giving us a peek at your studio, too. Thank you, Lori, for stopping by. I appreciate you having me. And we'll be right back. Our featured arts organization and upcoming arts events are next. Stay with us. AZ Creates is sponsored by Sibley's West, the Chandler and Arizona gift shop in historic downtown Chandler. A strong supporter of Arizona creatives, Sibley's West features work from more than 200 artists specializing in Arizona items and souvenirs, including art, pottery, food, jewelry, and much more. Now open at 72 South San Marcos Place in Chandler. Online shopping is also available with convenient and safe curbside pickup. Visit www.sibleyswest.com for details. It's a great time to start venturing out to arts events around the state. Something to look forward to is coming up. But first, AZ Creates highlights the Ocotillo Artist Group a local arts organization formed in 2019 by Sandy Ashbaugh and Michelle Borquin. It's a network of high-quality artists and craftspeople of various mediums who live in or near the Ocotillo area of Southern Chandler, Arizona, but is open to other artists in the area as well. They support and encourage each other and welcome emerging artists with in-person and online meetings on the third Wednesday of every month. The group has held two juried art shows and plans to host a self-guided studio tour in the near future. Follow them on Facebook and Instagram at Ocotillo Artists Group. It's probably a chaotic time on many Zoom meetings right now as arts organizations scramble to figure out whether or not they can start doing live events again as they try to plan for a fall season of theater perhaps or as they determine when they can start trying to rehearse together again. It is all something to look forward to. So here's Cat Beard with arts events from around the state. Thanks, Lori. It's a springtime palette of color here in Arizona. We also celebrate Easter that's hippity hopping our way. So let's get outdoors, enjoy some beautiful music, stroll through a gallery or two, and search for these creative events throughout the state. Experience a unique mix of string and percussion instruments with the Scottsdale Center for the Performing Arts through the Classical Lounge curated by Musica Nova with Burkina Dreams in the Desert featuring AZ63 performing an in-person and live stream concert on Saturday, March 27th from 2 to 4 p.m. 
then sit back and experience a singer whose vocal range has been compared to Natalie Cole and Whitney Houston with Nio Jones at the Live and Local on the Lawn venue on Friday, April 2nd at 7.30 p.m. For tickets and details, visit scottsdaleperformingarts.org slash events. Celebrating Palm Sunday, vocalists and chamber musicians from the Musica Nova Orchestra perform a fascinating interpretation of Stabat Mater on March 28th from 2 to 3.30 p.m. at the Scottsdale Presbyterian Church. The concert will mix selections from composers Giovanni Battista Pergolisi and Johann Sebastian Bach with concertmaster Cristiano Rodriguez, leading the second half of the program with Joseph Haydn's Symphony No. 49, Le Passion. For tickets and information, visit musicanovaaz.org. Stroll through a fabulous shopping experience at the Highland Yard Vintage Market in the Merchant Square in Chandler. On March 25th through 28th from 10 a.m. to 6 p.m., you can find the things your heart loves for your home, including gorgeous furniture, gifts, clothing, jewelry, one-of-a-kind vintage, seasonal decor, and delicious baked goods all under one roof. And every purchase supports local designers, too. Admission is free. For more details, go to highlandyardvintage.com. Relax at home with a virtual concert by the Flagstaff Symphony Orchestra as they perform Serenade for Strings, now through March 31st at 7 p.m. Marking their first concert since the pandemic began, enjoy the music of Samuel Barber's incomparable Adagio for Strings, Victor Herbert's Serenade for String Orchestra, Opus 12, and many other classics. For tickets and details, go to flagstaffsymphony.org slash serenade. The Mesa Historical Museum is enjoying an Arizona spring with their annual festival, March 27th from 9 a.m. to 5 p.m. Shop at a variety of local arts and crafts booths. Listen to live local musicians. View more than a dozen classic cars and feast on tasty concessions and bake sale. Admission is free. To learn more, visit mesahistoricalmuseum.com slash events. Connect with Hack the Mac, an introduction to the Mesa Art Center's Art Studios programs on Saturday, March 27th from 2 to 4 p.m. Featured is Wood Burning with Alexandra Bowers, where you will learn the basics and a beginner's how-to wood burning workshop. Registration for this workshop is $40 with materials provided. All you need to bring is your creative ideas. Then check out the classes being offered now through the Mesa Art Center. The Art Studios offers over 1,000 youth and adult classes, workshops and camps in 14 different visual arts such as glass blowing, pottery, painting, printing, ceramics, jewelry, and graphic arts. For more information, go to mesaartcenter.com. Get in on the laughs when you go to the Improv Mania Comedy Club in Chandler with two comedy shows in March and early April. Michael Longfellow appears Friday and Saturday, March 26th and 27th, or see Keith Ellis on Friday and Saturday, April 2nd and 3rd. Both shows start at 9 p.m. with doors open at 8 p.m. Seating is limited, so get your tickets soon. And if you miss the shows, stretch out your own comedy routine at the weekly open mic nights or improv and stand-up comedy shows, or sign up for the many classes offered to kids, teens, and adults. For more information and tickets, visit improvmania.net. Take a trip down the musical lane of the 50s as you enjoy the marvelous Wonderettes at the Scottsdale Desert Stages Theater in the Coolity Hall now through March 28th. This smash off-Broadway hit takes you to the 1958 Springfield High School Prom, where we meet Betty Jean, Cindy Lou, Missy, and Susie, four girls with hopes and dreams as big as their crinoline skirts, with classic 50s hits including Lollipop, Dream Lover, and Lipstick on Your Collar. Tickets are going fast, so visit DesertStages.org. An exhibition showcasing reproductions of the complete series of Yutagawa Hiroshig's The 53 Stations of the Tokaido will be on view at the Yumei Japanese Gardens now through May. 
this series is a timeless masterpiece of vibrant scenes representing a noble feudal lord's lifestyle, realistic images of ordinary people's daily life, and seasonal landscapes in woodblock print. And take time for a moment of zen by touring the various gardens, too. For more information and admission fees, visit youmaygardens.org. Do you love to quilt? Then you'll love the 16th Annual Art of Quilting Show, presented by H.D. South at the Gilbert Historical Museum, running now through May 31st. The show theme is blue and white quilts, with nearly 75 quilts made through the H.D. South Quilting Group. Open on Tuesday and Thursday through Saturday from 9 a.m. to 4 p.m. For more details and admission information, visit hdsouth.org. Johnny Cash captured the spirit of America, and you can enjoy this spirited production of Ring of Fire, presented by the Phoenix Theatre Company. You'll enjoy 38 songs from the Men in Black's catalog of music, telling stories of change and growth, with a winning cast capturing important moments in their lives. This production is available now at the Central United Methodist Church outdoor venue through April 4th. For tickets, dates, and showtimes, visit phoenixtheater.com. As spring flowers bloom, art galleries and museums are opening, which makes it an ideal time to check out Arizona's creative talent throughout the state. The Village Gallery, located in Sedona, shows a wide variety of local artists, styles, and mediums with unique Southwest gifts. The Sacred Art Gallery in Scottsdale specializes in spiritual and cultural-based paintings and sculptures, ideal for viewing during the Easter holiday. The Fippen Art Museum in Prescott features the heritage of the American West, cowboys, rodeos, and nature. Enjoy a rich cavalcade of paintings and sculptures in this gallery museum venue. Consider the Bati Indian Arts Gallery in Tucson, specializing in the art of Navajo, Hopi, and Zuni baskets, jewelry, textiles, pottery, fetishes, and katsinas. In downtown Chandler, the Vision Gallery is hosting an exhibition of Approaching the Natural that expresses curved edges in Mary Meyer sculptures to the free-flowing lines in Amy Ollinger's work, now through April 10. The Desert Artisans Gallery in Tucson's latest exhibition is Western Celebration, featuring local works in painting, sculpture, and jewelry to honor the West's raw, natural beauty and unique wildlife, as well as its diverse cultures open now through May 8th. And do some shopping at the On the Edge Gallery on Main Street in Old Town Scottsdale, where you will find more than 40 local Arizona artists displaying their original fine art and unique gift items. This gallery offers direct from the artist pricing in a variety of mediums throughout the 2400 square foot gallery. There are many more galleries that are open throughout the state, so consider giving your support and be sure to contact these galleries for more information, special exhibitions, and gallery hours. Be respectful to those who still observe safety protocols when you attend these events, and also check for possible cancellations or rescheduling. Do you know of any other events that we can share to our viewers at AZ Creates? Then hop down your bunny trail and send us an email at azcreates.artonlineaz at gmail.com. We wish you a happy and blessed Easter and color your world as you attend these events, which is something to look forward to. See you next time. Great job, Kathy. Thank you. Our featured author in What Are You Reading is straight ahead. AZ Creates is sponsored by Mary Contreras State Farm Insurance. A longtime supporter of the arts, Contreras offers insurance for autos, homeowners, renters, personal, business, life, and health, plus annuities and mutual funds. Located in Tempe, contact Mary Contreras through her website at marycontreras.com. Today's author in What Are You Reading spent some 30 years in law enforcement, so Timothy Moore has the perfect background to write Mirandize Nation about the history of the Miranda rights in the United States, and it started right here in Phoenix. AZ Creates welcomes Timothy Moore. Thanks for being with us today. 
Thank you, Lori. I'm happy to be here. Everyone has heard the phrase, you have the right to remain silent. And in your book, Mirandai's Nation, you tell readers how that phrase came to be. But before we get to the book, I'd like you to tell us about your 30-year career in law enforcement and some of the different jobs that you've had. Well, I began my career as a Maricopa County Deputy Sheriff in 1982. And I worked patrol areas of uh, Avondale and Buckeye, where I learned to do the job essentially without a partner or backup. That's what deputies do. Uh, I was selected as a recruit training officer after a few years to serve at the Phoenix Regional Police Academy to help police recruits. And um, that, a, that academy trains most of the Valley agencies. I saw uh, the Phoenix Police Department was good paying and they had a lot going on in training. And I applied and was hired there in 1986. At Phoenix, I um, was in patrol for a number of years in both North and South Phoenix, Cactus Park, South Mountain, and Maryville precincts. I tested for detectives in 1990 and was assigned to the property crimes uh, unit in South Phoenix. I had the opportunity to work as the uh, detective at the airport, where I worked uh, cargo heist, pickpocket rings, and luggage thieves. In 95, I went to criminal, uh, what we call crimes against persons, and handled domestic violence cases. And then in 1999, I was assigned to the homicide unit. I finished my career in the crime gun intelligence squad, where we received guns that were taken off bad guys on the street. Uh, we fired those guns into a water tank and recovered shell casings, then entered them into the NIBINS machine. NIBINS is the National Integrated Ballistics Information Network. And that machine would then compare numerous shell casings from other crime scenes with our shell casings and determine if the weapon had been used in other crimes where the shell casings had been collected uh, from those scenes. Uh, so that was quite rewarding for my last assignment. I retired from Phoenix PD in 2016 with a total of about 34 years in law enforcement. And what a wide, varied uh, uh, type of assignments that you had all during that time. Um, boy, is that going to be good fodder for more books, I think, right? Absolutely. Yeah, good. So your book is Miranda's Nation, the inside story of Ernesto Miranda and the Phoenix Police Department. It's about the criminal career of Mr. Miranda and right here in Phoenix and how his conviction actually pretty much changed the law enforcement process across the entire United States. Give us an overview of the book and how did you come to decide to write it? Well, uh, Ernesto Miranda was arrested in Phoenix in 1963 by Phoenix police detectives for kidnapping, rape, and robbery. They rush over it in the academy, but they don't really tell us all the details. And uh, just like Terry versus Ohio, or uh, any of the other landmark cases in the United States, this one uh, just seemed like nobody knew all the details. So it seemed fitting to me that someone from Phoenix PD write the story, explain the history of how Miranda warnings became the standard for interviews and interrogation nationwide. So most books uh, written on Miranda, I found they focus on the United States Supreme Court landmark decision in 1966 which is great, but these books are written by professors and lawyers, predominantly from the University of Arizona, which is also great. But none of these books uh, present more than a snapshot of the Phoenix Police Department or its officers. So I had the privilege of interviewing Carol Cooley, one of the arresting detectives of Ernesto Miranda. Uh, the other arresting detective uh, passed away in 1966. So I interviewed uh, Cooley on tape two additional times in order to get the story straight. Uh, I gained insight on how the department operated in the 60s and in reference to arresting and interviewing suspects. This information, coupled with the in-depth research, I thought was enough for a short story, which turned into a short book. So the book begins with Miranda's crimes, kidnapping, rape, and robbery, and our first victim, and, and how the police department responded to that. Uh, another victim, uh, Miranda's 
was a 22-year-old Barbara Sue McDaniel. She was a bank teller, and he followed her to her car. Uh, Miranda kidnapped her, and she was smart. She talked fast, and she was able to talk him out of raper. So she's the hero of the book, actually. She's a neat lady. So we go through Miranda's trials with two victims. Uh, he's found guilty and sentenced to 20 to 30 years in prison, and no one thought we'd ever hear of Ernesto Miranda again. With him in prison, uh, and the his attorney suggested an appeal due to his rights were violated, uh, Phoenix Police Department started changing things. And so I followed up with other cases. And what I found out is the uh, motel robberies on Van Buren through that summer of 63, uh, what caught the attention of uh, robbery detail and homicide. The spoiler alert, during that process of catching those robbers, Carol Cooley was shot uh, by one of the motel robbers. Of course, he survived his wounds and, uh, and you know, I got to interview him. And uh, so that's quite exciting. But we get to meet uh, Chief Charlie Thomas, uh, who's credited for making the Phoenix Police Department uh, the well-trained modern department uh, that it is today. And he was there from 1951 to 1963. I take a brief yet concise walk through the U.S. Supreme Court decision of 1966 and how that decision was made. So in 1976, uh, Miranda was murdered in Phoenix in a place in downtown we call the Deuce. Uh, the book shows how Phoenix PD responded to that investigation, how they solved his murder. Uh, at the end, hopefully we've learned something about how the Miranda warnings came to be, about the Phoenix Police Department and its officers uh, from a credible source. And it is a very interesting book. And it just has, like you said, a lot of details that most people don't know about. And so just briefly, what is the Miranda warning then? When is it used and what? Uh, how, how does it, how is it used by police officers? Okay, the Miranda rights are used in, when someone is in custody and when they're going to be asked specific questions about a specific crime. So it's twofold, and they have to have both of those present. Uh, one of the things I would do is interview a suspect on a playground or a parking lot where they're clearly not in custody. And I would ask them questions about a specific crime. Miranda did not apply in the interview or interrogation was accepted in court. But both of those have to apply. They have to be in custody. They have to feel they're in custody. And you have to ask them specific questions about a specific crime. So if you are asking them in a park or someplace else other than in custody, have not been arrested, you're not required to give them, to Mirandize them. You're not required to give them the Miranda rights. Is that correct? That's, that's correct, yeah. Because I think we see this incorrectly in some books sometimes. But uh, good. So thank you for clarifying that. Um, now, you co-wrote Mirandai's Nation with Clark Lore. How did that work? And how did you uh, split up some of the duties of writing? Well, uh, initially, my audience is a jury, is a judge, is attorneys. So to write a book... Uh, from my point of view or from my experience, uh, it would probably be at Walgreens uh, next to the sleep aids. <laughs> so I enlisted uh, Clark Lore, an established author from Tucson, Arizona. Uh, he'd written uh, Devil's Kitchen and The Devil on 85. And uh, he wasn't squeamish about the rape or robberies. Uh, he was a Vietnam veteran. He has degrees in writing and English. And his editing mastery of, uh, of, of the language allowed the book to read uh, like a novel instead of like a police report. So to make uh, the book credible, uh, I developed the core from primary sources, interviews with retired officers, detectives, uh, including Carol Cooley, as well as newspaper articles, governmental documents, and one of Miranda's family members. But to put it all together, I needed the eye of Clark Gore. 
And it sounds like that was a great combination of the two of you to, to do that, to do it that way. Um, now, you have also, though, since had some short stories published. Uh, what else are you working on now as far as writing goes? Well, I just finished a novel about Phoenix Police Homicide Unit. A uh, senior detective is in his last few years, has a new 30-something Hispanic female partner uh, whom he asked to show the ropes. Uh, she came from uh, assaults, uh, domestic violence, to homicide. And uh, so she's good at some things and she uh, needs some help with others, just like anyone who goes to a new assignment. And uh, as soon as I can do book signings again, we'll get that published and I'll be out there hawking it. That's great. So this is a true fiction novel then uh, for you, right? Totally fiction. All the people in it are fictitious. Of course. Uh, uh, any names that seem similar to any of my friends are merely because I like the names. There you go. Very good. So what is your best time uh, to write these days? Well, um, I can write any time. Uh, as long as I set aside the time to write. Uh, it can be day or night. And as long as I get that coffee pot fired up, and I review my notes, and I can just get at it. Good for you. Got to have that coffee. Isn't that something that most of us writers have to have? So um, do you have any advice for aspiring writers uh, who may have even come from a similar background? Yeah, I get that question asked quite a bit from other officers and from other folks. Uh, bottom line is write it down. Uh, you can have several ideas, even full books in your head. But it doesn't mean anything until your story is written out. So write it out. And uh, the other thing is to suggest, surround yourself with successful writers and authors. Now, the way I found to do this is I joined Sisters in Crime. Uh, it's a group mostly of women who read and write. Now, I joined this specific group because women read and women write. And they're usually smarter than most of us guys. So I belong to two chapters of Sisters of Crime, and I'm a board member with Sisters of Crime Grand Canyon Writers. I make myself available to members and answer questions on police procedures so that they can write it right. And a lot of times in trade, uh, there are beta readers for me, so it's, it's, it's a great uh, position for both of us. And that's a great way to do it, and a good organization to help you with that. Absolutely. And... I can imagine the stories that are in your head that you've got probably a few books to go, I hope. So uh, you can find out more about Timothy Moore and his books, Mirandize Nation, and maybe some short stories and the next book that is yet to come by going to his website at phoenixsleuth.com. It's been great having you here today, Tim. Thank you so much for joining us. Thank you for having me. Join us again in two weeks when we'll introduce you to photographer Dale Kessel of Phoenix, who has taken some spectacular Arizona scenery photos. And you'll meet author Barbie Ingle, who has written books for both children and adults about pain. We will highlight the Chandler Tullamore Sister City Group and their artist and author youth competition, and we'll have more arts events for you. That's episode 13 of AZ Creates. Some of us thrive on a little chaos, but Stephen Sondheim, the composer and lyricist known mostly for musical theater, says, Art, in itself, is an attempt to bring order out of chaos. Thanks for watching and for meeting our creatives. Please take a moment and drop us a short note in the comments below. We now have more than 100 subscribers to this channel. Thank you for your subscriptions. You can tap the bell for notifications when the next show is up or new content comes along. And please share this to your social media platforms, Facebook, Instagram, or send to friends and family and other art patrons. We also promote fine art and fine artists on our social media pages at Art Online AZ. And we also promote lots of arts events there. So here's wishing you manageable chaos in your life. Meanwhile, stay safe and healthy and make it a creative day. See you next time.